Welcome to Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. I'm your host, Russ Roberts of Stanford University's Hoover Institution. Our website is econtalk.org, where you can subscribe, comment on this podcast, and find links and other information related to today's conversation. You'll also find our archives where you can listen to every episode we've ever done going back to 2006. Our email address is mail at econtalk.org. We'd love to hear from you. Today is December 7th, 2012, and my guest is Don Boudreau of George Mason University. We blog together at Cafe Hayek, and our topic for today is Hayek, the man, F.A. Hayek. And I have to say, uh, Don, although we blog together at Cafe Hayek, and I write about Hayek a lot, I've learned much of what I've learned about Hayek from Don. And I thought what we would do today is a couple things, give an overview of Hayek's work, uh, his, his written work, and then suggest a path for readers who are beginners, who don't know much Hayek, where you should start. Because I think a lot of people think they should start with the road to serfdom, and that wouldn't be where I would start, maybe where you would start, Don. And essentially, this will be an annotated bibliography. What are the major works of Hayek, uh, and what are their significance? What are the key ideas in those works? And uh, how a reader might begin to approach it. So, Don, why don't you start, give us an overview of his writing. Well, Hayek, he was born in 1889 in, in Austria, and uh, or, or he started writing, or became famous early on uh, in the German-speaking world. He was writing on uh, money and banking issues in, in some articles in German. I don't read German. These articles have been translated into English since, and he gave in the early 1930s, maybe late 1920s, a series of lectures at the London School of Economics uh, that were a big hit uh, among some people. Uh, those lectures uh, were uh, became his 1931 book, Prices and Production, a book he had written before in German, translated. Have, have you read that book? Yeah. All of it? Prices and Production? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It's not very long. No, but it doesn't matter. No. It's, it's hard to read. <laughs> uh, I, I, well, I, when I read it, I, I, I'd I already read other things by Hayek, so I kind of knew it was coming. Uh, but an even better book, I think, um, is his earlier book that he wrote in his late 20s uh, called Prices – well, excuse me, it, 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 it was written in German and it was translated into English, and it's called Monetary Theory in the Trade Cycle, hmm. uh, which I think is a very profound and, and, and lovely work. And so Hayek's early work was on money, banking, and, and, and what was then called trade cycle theory. We call you know causes of recessions and slumps, booms, and things of that sort. Um, uh, and – in, in thinking about the way that money works in an economy, uh, the way that the, the role that prices play in an economy, uh, Hayek was then uh, led to contribute uh, in a major way to the socialist calculation debate that was raging, that was begun by his uh, uh, older Austrian uh, mentor, Ludwig von Mises. Uh, and so this combination of Hayek thinking about the role of prices in in a business cycle theory and the role of prices in guiding an, an economy as opposed to an economy being guided by conscious central direction led Hayek to write what is no doubt his most famous academic uh, article, his 1945 uh, Use of Knowledge in society. It, it appeared in the December or September issue of the American Economic Review. It's a really profound work. I remember, it's the first thing I read by Hayek. We've talked about it many times on this program. Yeah. Vernon Smith, I have vivid memories of him talking about how, I think he's read it so many times. I, I remember uh, my professor and, as an undergraduate, Bill Field, he, he, he gave me a, uh, his copy of Hayek's collection, Individualism and Economic Order, which is where that essay is, one of many places where that essay is reprinted. And he said, here, read this, read this article by Hayek. I was only a sophomore in college. And he said, you won't get it all, uh, but just read it. And I remember taking it home that night and laying in bed and reading it. And I, I could tell that it was, it was really profound, but I could also tell there was a lot that I wasn't getting. I've probably then over the, past, you know, over the subsequent 35 years read it probably 35 times, at least once a year, I'm sure. And I continue to get things out of that article. It's a really deep article. 
on the role of prices and the role of dis- and, 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 and the reality of dispersed knowledge and how prices enable people, uh, you know, many individuals, none of whom have complete knowledge of the economy, to nevertheless uh, act as if they know well enough what other people are doing so that those actions are coordinated and you get productive economic activity as as a result and rather than chaos. It's a really profound article. And we have we have that article up on the Library of Economics and Liberty website and you'll find a link to it at, uh, with this podcast. Yeah. Um, and so that was 45 that he published that. Uh, again, most of his writing before that was, was pretty, up until that time, was te- very technical on money and banking and, 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 and socialist calculation. And you should mention his... Capital theory. Yeah, you should mention his 1941 book, which we're not going to recommend either, but... Uh, well, well, the, the, the Pure Theory of Capital. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, I think, was... Actually, this is one of the few books by Hayek that I've not read cover to cover. Um, I should say Larry White, uh, my colleague Larry White, uh, has a wonderful introduction to the, um, came, uh, the, the, the Chicago... Uh, version that appears in Hayek's collected works. Um, and it, 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 Hayek intended that book as the first of at least two volumes, I think, the Pure Theory of Capital and the Applied Theory of Capital. Uh, that's, that's just a mare's nest for me, at least. Uh, so I, I haven't read it cover to cover. Um, in, in 1944, though, Hayek reached prominence outside of the economics profession. He was, by the way, uh, it should be known, I think you've probably mentioned this before, but I'll mention it again. Uh, Hayek was, as a young man in his 30s, he was one of the most influential economists uh, working, uh, in, certainly in the, in, in the world, uh, along with Keynes, uh, Sir John Hicks, who later went on to win you know, one of the earliest Nobel Prizes in economics, has this essay that he wrote sometime in the late 60s, early 70s, where he said, you know, sometime in the mid-30s, we, we economists, you know, we didn't know if it was, you know, it was going to be Hayek's ideas or Keynes's ideas that, that won out. Um, yeah, we still don't know. And, well, <laughs> yeah, it, it, certainly in the popularity contest, Keynes w- sure. won out. And, and the profession. And it, it caused Most Hayek of. to, you know, not only did Hayek lose out to Keynes, but he fell into professional... Uh, uh, disrepute's probably too strong a word, but he certainly be- became le- less well respected by the profession because his ideas were so different from those of of Keynes. Uh, in part because Hayek worried about the rhetoric that was in play during World War II and just before World War II broke out, both in the U.S. and particularly in Britain, where he lived, he became a British citizen. Um. He wrote his most famous work to this day. Uh, it's The Road to Serfdom. That was published in 1944, and then it was, it was uh, a condensed uh, into a Reader's Digest version here in the United States. And to everyone's surprise, it became a bestseller. Uh, and you know, it, it um, is a work, a much more popular work than anything else Hayek has ever written, certainly any other book Hayek has written. But it's not... Uh, it's not a uh, a coffee table book. It's not a page. Well, it might be a coffee table book if you call it a book well, that well, sits on the coffee table and you don't read and you let your guests admire it from a distance. It, yeah, in it's not way. a page turner. Uh, well, if you like, it is for me because I like Hayek. <laughs> but it, I mean, it, it, my, 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 but what, what I mean is, it's it's uh, it's not a book for partisan politicians or or, or, or is it the the you know the, the some people in the Tea Party might like the book. Some people. In the Republican Party might like the book. Some people in the Tory party in Britain might like the book. But it's not a book about partisan politics. It is a deep work of uh, political philosophy. Uh, uh, yet it became, became quite, quite famous. Um, so, that, so Hayek wrote four um, books on, broadly on political philosophy, not so much on, on, on economics. The Road to Serfdom was the first in 1944. And then in 1960, he published what I, I think he probably thought would be his last major work on that topic. Uh, it's the largest in terms of page length, word length. That's the, the Constitution of Liberty. Uh, and then in the 1970s, he uh, published his three-volume uh, 
work, Law, Legislation, and Liberty. Uh, and then the last book that he published in the year, just a few years before he died, he died in 92, and The Fatal Conceit, uh, which has the phrase that you like so much about the curious task. The curious task of economics is to demonstrate to men how little they really know about what they imagine they can design, yeah. which listeners have heard many times. That book was published in, in 1988. 88? 88. Uh, Hayek died in 92. Uh, and so those are the f- big four uh, political philosophy works of Hayek. There's a lot of, you know, a lot of overlap, not, uh, not redundancy, but a lot of overlap in themes, of course. But, well, we'll talk about them. that in a yeah. second, but let's just finishing up the, 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 the span. Uh, he also wrote a, a number of books on money in that later period, coming back a little bit to his early, to his youth. He wrote uh, Tiger by the Tail and the, the denationalization the, of money, right? Tiger Two. by the Tail is a, um, uh, it's, it, it's, a, it's a series of excerpts of passages from various of his works, some, some of which are from the pure theory of capital. And the late Suda Shinoi was instrumental in helping to compile the, 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 the readings in A Tiger by the Tail. I don't believe that there are any uh, uh, original writings by Hayek. In a t- I could be wrong on that, but I know I a, it. much of I it. Do- I doubt you're wrong. Okay. <laughs> excuse me. And the, much, much, much of it is, 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 are excerpts from his earlier works. Um, the, he, he, wrote, he continued to write several articles on, on macro money issues. Uh, as late as you know, in 1969, he had a piece in the, in the Journal of Political Economy, which you know, is one of the highest ranking uh, professional journals in economics on, on David Ricardo and, and money. Uh, in the 19, mid-1970s, Hayek uh, published uh, two pamphlets that were very closely related to one another on the denationalization of money. Um, I forget what the title of the first one is, but the, 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 the second version of it is called Denationalization of – I think the first one was Competition and Currency, which came out in 1976. And then a year later, he published a revised, expanded version of that called Denationalization of Money – I believe that both were published originally by the IEA in London and in Institute of, Ec- Institute Ec- of Economic Ec- Affairs. Yeah. And in the denationalization of money, uh, Hayek uh, rejected his earlier view, which was commonly held by most economists, that money was one of the things that the government, it's one of the few things that the government must supply because the private market can't, can't supply it. And Hayek... Uh, Reflected more and learned a little bit more uh, economic history and discovered that, uh, yeah, well, in fact, the market is probably a more reliable supplier of money than is uh, the state. Uh, he was probably influenced in this event, sort of belated influence by his his uh, former student uh, Vera Vera Lutz, uh, who who wrote a, a wonderful book called The Rationale of Central Banking. Back, it was her dissertation under Hayek back in the 30s. Uh, that book is published by Liberty Fund now, The Rationale of Central Banking. And it's a very accessible introduction to uh, debates in, 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 throughout history on the role of money, what, what, the role of banks. And uh, it, it has, you know, the, the, a kernel, it, 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 it has strong suggestions that, that central banking is not all it's cracked up to be, to put it to put it mildly. Anyway, so Hayek uh, in, the 19, in 1960 with the Constitution of Liberty, uh, he did not believe that the market could handle the supply of money. 15, 16, 17 years later, he believed it could, and and wrote very eloquently on that matter. Um, and uh, the he has some other collections of essays. Yeah, talk about the three main ones being. Uh, oh, the main one still being his 1948 collection, Individualism and Economic Order, which is where the uh, I think it's the first place where the use of knowledge in society was first reprinted, published by Chicago. In 1967, he has a collection. Uh, it was published called Studies in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics. In, or 1968, rather, in 1977, um, a, a second sort of collection came out, New Studies in Philosophy, Politics, Economics, and the History of Ideas. Uh, 
and you know, just reading, uh, if, you, if, you, if you, and I don't think there's any overlap between, in fact, I'm sure there's no overlap between the essays in any of those three collections of 48, 67, and, 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 and 78, I, some yeah, late 70. 70s, mid 70s, late, early 60s, mid 60s. Um, the range of Hayek's scholarship is astonishing. Uh, uh, scientific method, psychology, uh, uh, the role of money, the role of prices, history of ideas. He has essays on Richard Cantillon, essays on David Hume, essays on Adam Smith, um, political philosophy, his uh, you know, wonderful essay on, on liberalism. Uh, and which reminds me to mention one of my favorite Hayek essays that I'm surprised is not mentioned more by uh, friends of Hayek or friends of the of of, of, of classical liberals. It's mentioned, but it, it, it I think it deserves more attention. It's the opening essay in Individualism and Economic Order. It's called Individualism: True and False, and it's an incredibly profound piece. Uh, it was a nineteen. 44 or 45 lecture that he delivered in Dublin. And in that lecture, he distinguishes between what, what he calls a false individualism from of French rationalism, the individualism of Rousseau and, 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 and the French rationalists, the encyclopedists, as he called them, uh, where, you know, the individual is this great, wonderful, all-powerful being who can create his own reality and, and you know, stand to thwart of uh, forces that he doesn't like. Uh, and, you know, Hayek rejected that view in favor of the true individualism that he associates with de Tocqueville, Adam Smith, David Hume, and, uh, um, the, 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 the Scottish philosophers. And that's an individual, John Locke, uh, that's an individualism that r- respects the rights of the individual, but understands that the individual is embedded in, um, uh, society and society is not and cannot be the result of anyone's conscious plans and that if false individualism takes hold then people get the mistaken idea that they can that somehow the you know powerful wonderful smart and hyper intelligent individuals can 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 form society to their liking and hayek warns in this essay that i mentioned individualism true and false that the false individualism uh, th- uh, threat. If false individualism takes hold, <laughs> it will lead to collectivism because you 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 need this all po- you need a powerful agency to bring your uh, notions into into being, and that powerful agency is the state. Uh, and true indiv- true individualism is a much more modest view of uh, individual rationality uh, and the scope of individual action, all embedded in. Uh, uh, you know, a spontaneous order over which no individual has uh, you know, any conscious any conscious control, and and the idea of guiding society consciously and the uh, and rationally, capital R rationally, in the true individualist view is 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 recognized to be nonsense. Uh, and Hayek ends that uh, essay in a, in a really stirring. Way he, uh, if, if you don't know mind, I'll, I'll, I'll read it. Uh, this is the final paragraph from that essay, uh, w- quoting now Hayek. What individualism teaches us is that society is greater than the individual only insofar as it is free. Insofar as, as it is controlled or directed, it is limited to the powers of the individual minds which control or direct it. If the presumption of the modern mind which will not respect anything that is not consciously controlled by individual reason, does not learn in time where to stop. We may, as Edmund Burke warns us, and he's now quoting Burke, be well assured that everything about us will dwindle by degrees until at length our concerns are shrunk to the dimensions of our minds. End quote. And end of essay. Uh, and I think it's really profound. Um, Hayek in that essay it warns that in, in order to have what he later called a great society, n- not, not to be confused with Lyndon Johnson's great society by any means, to have a great, an extended order that maximizes the prospects for each individual to achieve as many of his or her goals as, as he or she wants, c- consistent with the same abilities of millions of others. In, in order for that society to, to exist, we, we, we have to give up the, the fantasy 
that society can be consciously directed and planned. If you try to consciously direct and plan, then it reduces <laughs> this this extended order to the dimensions of of the individual human mind. And, who's and that's, doing the, the one who's doing the planning? What? Yeah, and and, and that, those are very small dimensions indeed compared to uh, the, the you know the the amount of knowledge and scope uh, uh, and, and range of knowledge that is constantly at work and taking advantage of uh, through the decentralized, spontaneous market process. Oh, that was lovely. Um, let's turn to the to the four works of of uh, political philosophy. And what I want to do is my, my plan for the rest of this conversation, we'll go through each of those. So you'll talk about the main ideas. And then we'll, in the last part of our conversation, you'll give your advice on where to start in accessing this range of stuff. And I'll, I'll give maybe a little bit of my own input. But uh, look, why don't we start with the road to serfdom, which we've talked about before on this program ex- in an extended way. So give us a to the extent you can, a thumbnail sketch of what it's about. It is the best known of the four. So I but yeah, by by far. And it's probably the most accessible of the of the four. Um but again it's a serious work. It's not a you know it's not a <laughs> it's not a, a partisan work by any means. Um a, a high, it, it's it's Hayek's book length attempt to make people aware really of the of the message in I think individualism the essay Individualism True and False. And look, and the, by the way, when was that essay written? So it was collected in 48. It was collected in 48. It was a lecture that Hayek delivered in Dublin uh, in 19, in uh, December of 1945. Okay. Um, and uh, so it was actually, it was after, unless they delivered after the road. But the, the message, I think, is very much the same. And it's, it, it's a warning that, it's, it, it's, against, it's a warning against hubris. Uh, you, Hayek saying, you want a great society. You want a society in which people have maximum scope to prosper, maximum freedom from arbit- the arbitrary will of others, then you have to rely upon abstract principles. You have to rely upon general rules to guide your action, and you can't get impatient uh, to uh, create worlds that you can imagine. Uh, uh, you, you, you can't get so impatient that you, you try to create those worlds Consciously, because to create those worlds consciously, you have to violate a lot of uh, general principles, violate rules of private property, violate rules of the way the the the, the market order works. Uh, and by doing that, not only do you risk, uh, do, do you reduce people's f- political freedoms, but you don't even achieve, you won't even achieve the goals that you set out to achieve because the human mind, not even the best human minds, the best and the brightest collected in, you know, a a room with the world's most powerful computers, uh, can, can, can can hope to, um, begin to, to get a, to, to, to plan, uh, or even to intervene in any reasonably, uh, successful way in the larger market order. It's just too big. This great society is too big. And we don't realize how, how big and magnificent it is because we take it for granted. Um, this is a theme I don't, I don't, I, 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 well, I, I don't recall this theme exactly in Hayek, but I probably get it from him somewhere since I get so much from Hayek. And that's, I, I, you know, the, the standard economist's view is that the, the, we need government intervention because of market failure. I almost think it's the opposite. We, we get government intervention because of market success. Uh, the market is so amazingly good at working, uh, you know, not perfectly, but it's, it, it work, it's, it just keeps plugging on, plugging on. And we become unaware of, uh, the great complexity that is, that the market's taking care of at every moment. And the market is, is dealing with at every moment. So it makes us a little bit blasé about being able to introduce, you know, introduce regulation. We kind of think that the wealth we have and the smoothness with which, and success with which our daily lives go on, we kind of think this is normal. It's something that just kind of happens. Uh, you don't, we don't see the market working. And Hayek warns against the hubris of thinking that we can plan and do better than the market. One of the, the major and continuing the major and continuing misperception of Hayek is that Hayek, here's the misperception. 
uh, oh, we can't take Hayek seriously because Hayek said the moment you have any untoward government intervention, you're on a road to serfdom and you can never turn back. Slippery slope that just slides it, into – Yeah. It, and it, since it, that didn't happen or hasn't happened yet in America, obviously uh, the book's wrong hi, yeah, and, or, in, or in England. Or, and the only thing I can say is people who – who say that about Hayek have not read the book or they have not read the book carefully. And they certainly have not read Hayek's many, many subsequent uh, uh, protestations. He said, I did not say that. What Hayek said about the, the road to serfdom is that uh, if government attempts to protect everyone from any kind of from, from every form of economic disappointment, right? uh, protect all workers from suffering uh, losses of income, protect uh, 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 all businesses from suffering declines in profits because of changes in trade patterns and changes in technology. If we attempt to protect against any downsides of market economic activity, right? The only way to do that, the only way to do that seriously would be to create a society of serfs. You can do it, but it'll be a really poor society and no one will have any freedom. That's the road to serfdom. He's saying, look, if you insist on having a society in which no one suffers economic disappointment because of changes in uh, 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 trade patterns, changes in consumer taste, changes in technology, things of that sort. If you insist on protecting everyone from disappointment, you, you cannot achieve that goal until serfdom is reached. You'll get tyranny. You'll, then you will get tyranny, right? So it's not an argument against the slightest form of government intervention. Indeed, if you read The Road to Serfdom, in fact, a lot of people uh, on the right, when they, when they read it for the first time, they're disappointed now because Hayek is not – a Murray Rothbardian or to take a different, slightly different uh, David Friedman or even a Milton Friedman or even a H- Hayek of the 1980s uh, 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 libertarian. He, in that book, uh, uh, accords a great deal of responsibility to the state uh, or, or at least says, look, if the state does this, it's, it's not necessarily a bad thing. And, you know, uh, uh, welfare, you know, minimum income guarantees. Uh, Socialized medicine. Yeah, he's got. And in a paragraph. Yeah, he's got. I always like when people say, well, you like Hayek. What about this paragraph? And yeah. I think uh, it's not, he's not a saint. I don't like that paragraph. Yeah. I don't agree with that paragraph. I think it's a bad idea. Maybe he changed his mind later. I don't care really. I don't have to accept everything he wrote as divine wisdom. It's thought provoking. That one, I disagree with. Him. I, th- I think, <laughs> I mean, I think that's a good response as much as I like as much as I great, greatly admire Hayek's work, uh, it doesn't commit one to gr- agreeing with every word he said. You don't have to accept him ho- uh, whole or not at all. Uh, but it's not even clear to me how much Hayek was endorsing those things as he was saying uh, these things are consistent with a, a free and open and great society. Um, he's got some passages in, in The Road to Surf and then I recall where he says, you know, the the – I can't his exact terms, but you know the the, the you know, political expectations have have come so come along so far by the mid 1940s that it's just foolish to think that we can return to you know, like the British laissez-faire era of the 1860s. Um, and so, c- given that people expect uh, these uh, actions by the state, we can do X, Y, and Z. Now, he says that quite explicitly. And so to say that Hayek argued that we shouldn't do X, Y, and Z, or if we did do X, Y, and Z, we'll eventually wind up in a state of serfdom, it, it, it indicates that whoever's reading it did not uh, read it carefully, so or I, if I, at I, all. I want to move on to, an, to yeah. the next book, but I, I just finished reading Anti-Fragile by Nassim Taleb, and he says in there, this is a very interesting thing, he says, he says in, in the Middle East, a prophet is not somebody who sees the future. It's somebody who issues a warning. And we confuse those. We think a prophet is somebody who can see the future. And if you look at, the, at, at in the Bible, when you know when Jonah is told by God to go warn the people of Nineveh that they're they're going to sin and they're, that they're going to be destroyed, Jonah runs away. He doesn't want to deliver that that prophecy because he knows that 
they'll repent, and then God won't destroy them, and he'll look silly. Mm -hmm. So most of the the Old Testament prophets were uh, – they were warning about what would happen if people didn't pay heed. They were not saying, here is the future – Get ready for it. Yeah. And I think that's a nice distinction to think about Hayek's role in the road to serfdom. Yeah, yeah and keep in mind, this was written in the 40s. Like, like all of us, Hayek is a creature of his time, um, and, and he changed his mind on a number of issues. And I, there's no question in my mind that Hayek became more uh, libertarian, more radical as he aged. I mean, I mentioned the money issue earlier. That's, yeah. that's when Hayek became more skeptical of government efforts to— uh, 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 you know, govern what we call antitrust efforts. He became more skeptical of that over time. Uh, he, he was not an anarchist. He never became an anarchist. Although he says somewhere, as I think Milton Friedman said a similar thing too, he says somewhere toward the end of his life, it was, an, it was an interview, maybe one he did with Tom Hazel, I don't recall exactly, where he said, if I were a younger man, uh, he said, I, I, I think I might find that position. So the anarchism is laid out by David Friedman, for example, um, more appealing. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he, that, that, that indicates that he, he recognized that he was becoming more, more radical. But he never did become an anarchist. And the fact that, that uh, uh, he had, even toward the end of his life, he accorded more scope to state action than many libertarians do today does not mean that he was not a great, great champion of individual liberty. But one thing, he certainly never, ever said that the slightest movement away from laissez-faire will, will inevitably Inexorably. create yeah. Soviet totalitarianism or something like that. But, that, that, but that's how it constantly gets painted like that. And I think the reason people paint him like that is because if you do so and it sticks, then it's very easy to dismiss, dismiss everything it, yeah. else he says. So let's, let's move on to uh, the constitutional liberty. Mm -hmm. What is that book about? Why is it important? Uh, the, Hayek said when he wrote Law, Legislation, and Liberty, he says he wished he wouldn't have used the title Constitutional Liberty for the Constitutional Liberty because he would like to use it for his 1970s <laughs> work. Uh, he, he tries to set out in the Constitution of Liberty uh, in somewhat more detail uh, what his ideal society would, would look like. I think of the Constitution of Liberty in two, as being in two parts. Uh, and, and in my, I don't know if it, if it really tracks in terms of the number of pages, but I think I mean, it's two halves. You know, the first half is just a restatement, in a lot of ways more, even more eloquent uh, than the road to serfdom, restatement of his political philosophy, the, the, uh, uh, the importance of recognizing the dispersion of knowledge, uh, a lot of you know, public, what we call today public choice insights. Uh, you, know, you, you, know, you, you just can't give power to someone and expect that that person is going to use it uh, you know, in 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 other interests, in other the way that, ways. in the way that you'd like them to, in the way that you'd like them to, um, and then in the second, as the book progresses, he lays out in more detail uh, specific policies, uh, many of which I disagree with. Uh, it, it's it's for my taste, uh, far more of an interventionist a creed than 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 I have. Uh, in some ways, even more interventionist than comes across in The Road to Serfdom. Uh, Hayek's got a few paragraphs in The Road to Serfdom where he gives a lot of uh, – he says, well, the state can do this X, Y, and Z. Uh, they know, they shock modern libertarians. And, and, and he's got several you know, chapters in Constitutional Liberty where he's laying out you know, explaining how the state – why the state should do various things. So it's things. a bad book. No, it's not a bad book. Just it's a great, kidding. It's a, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it, it, it's, a great, it's a great book. Uh, and, you know, even – Look, scholars of the quality of Hayek, even when you disagree with them, you learn something by by reading them. And certainly for people like me, uh, uh, you know, when I disagree with Hayek, I I worry. I think, okay, there's, there's something I'm missing. Um, but on 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 the particular issue of the of the Constitution of, of it, by the way, it's my least favorite of the four of the four books. Although there are some incredibly soaring, wonderful passages in it. Which is unusual for Hayek. You don't get a lot of soaring with well, Hayek. Well, <laughs> you know, just really quickly, I, I've read Hayek so much, I actually find him easy to read. And most people don't. And I understand he has this very weird Germanic, not weird, but it's a typical Germanic sentence structure and it goes on and on and on and on and on. But I, I, I'm so accustomed to it, I read it and I get it. The final chapter in The Road to Serfdom is very famous. It's called The Why, Road to Serfdom, the Constitution. No, excuse me, The Constitutional Liberty. Why I am not a conservative. And Hayek explains why he is not a 
conservative, and a lot of people take that to be a joke. Well, he's really conservative. Again, Hayek was not a false individualist of the sort of French rationalism sort. Um, Hayek was not an individualist in the sense that he believed that people could willy-nilly, uh, individuals could willy-nilly choose which which uh, uh, conventions and social rules to live by and which to reject. Uh, but he was a he was not a conservative in, in the sense that he, unlike genuine conservatives, he welcomes so- social change. But just that change should come spontaneously. Uh, uh, true conservatives want to use the state to to protect certain social institutions from from change. Hayek, for example, I think, and I'm, I'm speculating now, but consistent with what is in the final chapter of the Constitutional Liberty, I'm pretty sure Hayek would say, you know, uh, same-sex marriage, uh, there's no reason for the state not to recognize same-sex marriage. Uh, it, it would have been inappropriate for the state in 1970 to sort of demand that, that uh, uh, you know, every, everybody uh, uh, applaud same-sex marriage. Society wasn't there, right? Uh, now society is there, and so there's no reason we should resist that. There's no, there's no, and there's no reason we should fear same-sex marriage at all because society evolved to accept uh, uh, same-sex relationships. Well, I'm, not, I'm not sure. When you say society well, accepts it, there's still quite well, a bit of difference. Different opinions. Well, okay, it's we're, certainly we're, more acceptable. We're evolving, we're evolving toward it's it. It's more acceptable than it was. Yeah. So it's the government's role in implementing it wouldn't be as problematic as it would be if it were imposed from the top down at that much in 1970s. Yeah, yeah. I mean, let me use the example just a, 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 a little bit differently. Hayek, unlike a lot of conservatives, would not say, you know, we must work to ensure that same sex marriage never comes about, you know, because it, it, it somehow is going to, you know, threaten. You know, deep institutions. Hayek was not a conservative in that way. He doesn't. He, he doesn't believe that. I'm sure he wouldn't believe that 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 social acceptance of same-sex marriage uh, is inconsistent with a prosperous, happy, you know, m- m- free society. Um, but it it those kinds of issues reflect deeply held, uh, evolved, socially evolved norms. And Hayek was very aware that using government to forcibly uh, to try to, to forcibly change norms uh, through legislation uh, is a dangerous business. I mean, even if we agree that the norms to which you know the the forcible legislation wants to move us are admirable in some way, Hayek says, "Look, you know, <laughs> you, you, you may get some unintended consequences from so, that." No, he had a tremendous respect for. He was a Burkean in that way. What you're calling norms, because he believed that they evolved and emerged in a bottom-up way and had the wisdom of individuals embedded in them, um, which, uh, which makes him something of a conservative, I have, to, I have to say, right? He's very respectful, various types of conservative, right? He's very respectful of, of norms that he probably didn't agree with. Yes, um, yes. Because he felt that they had stood the test of time. Yes. One of the problems with that, of course, is that a lot of norms that stand the test of time are repulsive. Yes. And so you, you have to decide, I mean, you don't have to decide anything, but it's hard. If you're making a judgment about uh, what's the right thing to do or what government should do, it's, 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 that's a little, it's a little trickier than just saying, well, we'll respect, we'll respect what society, what views people hold, um, and, and we'll let things emerge only from the bottom up. Obviously, there are, uh, not every emergent norm is, is a good norm. It's it's it maybe a good way to say it is, uh, the 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 Hayek was not a conservative in the sense that he would be willing to use the power of the state uh, to prevent the evolution away from uh, traditional norms. Traditional norms. Yeah. Uh, but he was a conservative in the sense that he is not willing to use the power of the state to force an evolution away from existing. Norms. The latter has to be qualified a little bit. Um, uh, Hayek does uh, explicitly, we alluded to this before, uh, give a, a role to legislation. Uh, he does believe that 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 common law uh, and, and also the, the the social mores and norms on which common law is based or, or springs from uh, c- 
can can go awry. And so he says, you know, sometimes it's appropriate to use legislation. It's a little bit of a tension in Hayek. And how do we when, how do we know? I mean, you know, the, the easy example is slavery. Uh, uh, no one, you know, this side of sociopathy, uh, believes that slavery w- w- was was anything other than just a com- completely, and unspeakably, horrendously immoral institution, and that if it, e- it exists, it existed just you know, 150, 160 years ago, it was appropriate in the United States. In the United exists States, in some parts yeah. of the world today, I understand. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so that's one area where we, you know, can 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 use the force of the state to break those those norms uh use legislation to break the the law that might have that might have kept slavery going there's something of a tension i got and i think it's i think it's fine we can you know there's ambiguity in reality we can recognize that that you know there, there's some hard there are many hard cases but but the hard cases shouldn't blind us to the 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 larger reality that hayek that hayek uh p- points to and and that is um most of the rules that govern our behavior uh, e- 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 evolved and, uh, uh, from time immemorial. They, they, they change as circumstances change. Uh, and we might not be able to understand fully what function these rules serve. Um, but our presumption should be that uh, – Evolved rules serve a good purpose. Now it's a re, it can, it's a rebuttable presumption, uh, which maybe it's a, another way to say Hayek was not a conservative. It's a rebuttable presumption, but that should be the presumption, which is a way of maybe saying Hayek is a conservative, right? In some sense, yeah. Let's let's move on to law, legislation, and liberty. Uh, the three volumes, mm-hmm. and I think you've read all three, is my guess. Yes, I've read one of them. I think, yeah. The, the the first volume is subtitled uh, Rules and Order. It came out in 1973. Second volume is entitled The Mirage of Social Justice. It came out in 1976. The third volume is called, I think, something like A Constitution for a Free People or something of that sort of the exact title, su- subtitle, subtitle. It came out in 1979. So give us a thumbnail it, it sketch. Is the, the, let me say the third volume is the one volume by Hayek that I wish we, he would never have published. Uh, I think it's by far his least impressive Work. I mean, there are parts of it that are fine, but all in all, it, it, we, we could have, we could have not, we, we, we can avoid it. Uh, but the first volume, Rules and Order, I consider it to be um, certainly one of the one of the two finest books I've ever read, uh, it, and it uh, makes this makes a distinction. Which we have talked, you and I have talked about yeah, before in this we, program. Oh, we but let's bring it back. Yeah, well, important. between between law and legislation, of course, to the modern mind, modern ear, those two words are synonymous. Right? What 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 do what does Congress do? Well, they make laws. In fact, they're called lawmakers. Um, and by the way, I mean that, that 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 use of terms goes back a long way. Adam Smith used law and legislation also as, uh, as synonyms. Uh, Hayek. Uh, makes the point that they, these are very, very different. Law is that which evolves uh, out of practice. Legislation is that which is designed consciously by people invested with the power to make, rule, make rules to govern an organization. Uh, so Congress makes legislation. Law is not made by anybody. Law is no more than prices are made by people. Hayek was very much influenced by any one person. By any one person, yeah. Hayek was very much influenced by the um, Italian uh, autodidact uh, Bruno Leone, who wrote um, a book called "Freedom and the Law" that Liberty Fund published. Uh, uh, the, the original version, I think, came out in 1963 or so. Um, Leone died right, tragically in 1967. And Hayek was in Bruno Leone's idea. I, 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 I think is the first to really have, drive home this idea that law is very much like a um, uh, market prices. Uh, they they are the result of human action, but not of human design. Of course, this is a a um, phrase from Adam Ferguson that Hayek likes very much. And contemporary of Smith. Contemporary of Smith and repeats 
often in one form or, or roughly another. Roughly contemporary, yeah. slightly before. But. Yeah, I think he wrote the book, it was like 817, 67 maybe, uh, and the Ferguson book. And uh, uh, Hayek very, very, very compellingly in the first volume of Law, Legislation, and Liberty explains the importance of distinguishing between legislation and law. And, and some of our listeners here, I think, as was I when I first started, what do we mean? We make the laws or laws emerge. Laws are things like the speed limit and, and the, what happens to you if you steal and the regulations for how much pollution you commit. Those are laws, and they're not, they don't come out from the bottom up. They're not the result of practice, or they're just laws. So when you say law or when Hayek says law, what, what do you mean it's distinctive from legislation? Socially imposed constraints on behavior – that are not designed by anyone. Suppose, suppose I live in Virginia. Suppose the state of Virginia, uh, for some odd reason, abolishes uh, all, from its books all prohibitions on uh, killing other people. Well, we say then, well, therefore, you know, what was murder yesterday in Virginia is now perfectly legal. It's still illegal. You, you, if you kill an innocent person in cold blood, you will be punished by someone. Right? It may not be the state police or the local police, you will be punished by someone. It is wrong to do that. We all recognize that it's wrong to do that. People will be constrained by society somehow from doing that. Now, it may be that the state is the best agency to invest with the power to uh, protect against murder and to punish those who commit murder. Uh, but that does not mean that it is the state that makes murder illegal. Murder is unlawful because of our social norms, not because some legislators decided, hey, let's make the killing of innocent people unlawful. Uh, it, it, the the, the pres prescriptions against murder are codified in all civilized societies and statute books, but that's not where they come from. Now, take the, 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 the law itself. Lawyers themselves have, have this, this long-standing distinction between uh, rules that are considered uh, um, malum and say, and rules that are considered malum prohibited. These are Latin terms. I can't quite. I don't. I don't know Latin, so I can't translate exactly. Malum and say are things. Mal sounds bad. Bad things. <laughs> that, things that are bad in and of themselves. And what that means is it's just bad. We just recognize them as bad. It's bad to steal. It's bad to kill other people. It's 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 bad to burn down someone else's house. We kind we kind of know what they are. They, they're not. They're just in and of themselves bad. Mal and prohibit are things that are bad simply because the authority, the reigning authority, has declared them be, to be bad. Uh, not paying 38.5% of your last dollar earned in income uh, to the IRS is mal and prohibita. It's not bad in and of itself. It, we, we, Going 66 miles an hour. Well, this is, this is the example I like, I like to use. You know, there's no more black letter law than posted speed limits. It's literally black letters posted on a white sign. Uh, and yet everybody drives in, you know, in, in, in most weather conditions, they drive a few miles over the speed limit. And they don't think of themselves as being lawbreakers. If you take seriously, if you say, well, you know, the law is what the legislature says, then if you drive 10 miles or five miles over the speed limit, you're, you're a lawbreaker no less than if you drive 80 miles over the speed limit. I mean, you know, maybe the severity of the is different, but, um, so th there is a distinction. I'm, I mean, I'm convinced it's real. There's a distinction between what the government says is and isn't uh, 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 allowed to do, and what the law, independent of what the government issues, says is or isn't allowed to do. There are lots of laws that we obey uh, in, in our daily lives that are not written down anywhere, that are not legislated anywhere, and yet we obey them. And the common law, which I greatly admired, the sort of formal common law that came out of British courts starting in the Middle Ages, uh, and was then transplanted in many ways to the U.S. Uh, from, by, by, the, by, by the British colonials. Uh, th th that common law is sort of the formalization of a lot of these social norms. So that's explain what common law is. Um, well, it has a variety of meanings. I mean, you know, one meaning, sort of the most mundane of the meanings, it was the law common to all of England, uh, as opposed to you know local rules and regulations and laws that that existed throughout the realm. Its most uh, relevant meaning, the way it's normally meant, is that it is the law that, well, sometimes it's, it's described as, well, it's judge-made law as opposed to king-made or, or parliament or legislature-made law. That's wrong. Uh, the 
Common law is not judge-made law. It's judge-found law. The judge finds the law. Two people have a dispute. They go into court, and the judge, perhaps judge and jury, uh, they find what, what, are the, what are the prevailing social expectations uh, that we can use to decide which of these two disputing parties is right. Which party was acting most uh, fully in conformity to the prevailing social expectations? Uh, if we find that the plaintiff was, the plaintiff wins the case. If we find the defendant was, the defendant wins the case. It's not that the judge makes the law. That would just be legislation coming from someone wearing a robe. Uh, so the common law is law that evolves up from and it, well, let me uh, give it, let individual me, behavior. Let me give a narrower definition, and, and then I want to come back to your point about judge found and judge made law. Um, literally, I think when people talk about common law, they mean the corpus, the body of cases that have been established as potential precedents in various rulings made by judges in disputes yeah. uh, or interpretations of, of legislation in various disputes. Um, because even no matter how well-specified regulations or legislations, uh, legislation is or regulations are, there's cases that fall in gray areas and have to be, quote, interpreted. Mm-hmm. Now, the, the, part I underst- the part I find strange about law, legislation, and liberty, rules and or- the first volume rules and order is that I take Hayek to be saying there, at least I think this is what I remember it, that this is what judges ought to do. The judges – he, he didn't – I view it as a normative claim as opposed to a positive claim. That is a claim about how the world ought to be or world, how we'd like it to be versus the world as it actually is. I'm sure some judge – and certainly I'm sure many judges think they make the law. Um, but I, well, the so way, A lot of times they, they do today because of the structure of our system, yeah. Yeah, but the way I interpret Hayek is saying is that – is this exploratory process that when a dispute comes along, uh, Hayek's interested that the, le- that the legal system allow people to set expectations, make plans, and, and execute those plans in coordination with others who may not have the same plans. And this is the great – one way to say that this is the greatest social problem we have. The economic system solves it through prices, that, that seemingly impossible coordination of – the fact that I want something you might want, uh, the prices adjudicate that dispute. Uh, if I want to buy it at that price, I do. And if you don't, then you step aside and let me have it. Um, but it, it, he saw, and, and correct me if I'm wrong or give your own interpretation, he saw that as the correct role for a judge, that the judges should look at what's expected. Yeah. And I use the example all the time on this program of you, know, you sell a house and you leave your house – in the condition that the buyer uh, should be happy to have it. You don't specify in the contract every single detail of what is done. And as a result, some people leave some things in the garage to be thrown out. Some people might leave various drapes and other things. that They don't specify you must remove all the drapes. Sometimes you say you have to keep the drapes. All those things are sort of in different parts of the country, different times, there's a certain level of expectation of cleanliness, of, of clutter, of things that would be left behind or not left behind. And, of course, people might dispute that because it's not written word for word in the, in, the, in the sales contract of the house. And a judge – the way I understand Hayek, a judge is saying – Hayek saying what the judge should do is figure out where that sale took place, what do people usually do that yes. seems to be fine with everybody. Yes. yes, He's not saying that's what judges do. Because they might not do that. They might say, that's an outrage. That basement was filthy. You should have. No, no, most certainly. I mean, to that extent, it is, it is normative. I, the, I, I take the positive part of the book uh, to be, to, to, to teach people to take seriously the distinction between law and legislation. There is a real and meaningful and important distinction between those two. And judges should uh, take that distinction seriously as well. Um, but so too should legislators, and so too should citizens. Uh, the, 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 one of the important things I see about the distinction is law really is important. No one wants to live in a lawless society. And so law very naturally and properly has a kind of sanctity about it. You, 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 we, we like the rule of law, right? Uh, if legislation it flies under the same flag as law— It's able to steal the sanctity that law has. And I think that's a really unfortunate thing. Um, 
the, 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 the dictates of a legislature, no matter how much you or I may agree or disagree with them, the, dic- the, the arbitrary dictates of a legislature um, are, are not law, as Hayek and I conceive of law. They are legislation. And therefore, they should not have the sanctity that law has. If you violate legislation, it, 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 it may be morally wrong. It may be you know, all sorts of uh, – it may be appropriate to punish someone who violates legislation. I don't I, – I, I'm leery of calling that person a lawbreaker in the same way that I'm leery of calling uh, legislators law, lawmakers. It, I, it's like when I hear legislators described as lawmakers, it's like here – for me, it's like fingernails on a chalkboard. Well, let me give you two examples. We're going to run it short on time here. We have a lot more to talk about, so we have to try to go quickly. But okay. I want to agree with you on that in one area and disagree on another. So uh, I think it's an incredibly important distinction uh, when I think about the steroid scandals in baseball. I think the distinction between law and legislation. People would say, well, they were cheaters, the people who used steroids. They they broke the rules of – and actually, there's, it's not always true that there were rules in baseball against steroid use. It was illegal to use steroids in, in certain situations, but that wasn't always – some of the things people were taking were not rules against, that baseball prohibited. But even if they had, uh, there are many, quote, unwritten laws yep. in baseball. Yep. Uh, and we've talked about it on the program before. But if everybody is using steroids, pitchers and batters, which apparently a large number were, you're not a cheater in the same way as if no one is using them. Yep. If there's not a social convention that it's, quote, OK. There are certain social conventions in baseball where it's OK to, quote, cheat. Um, you're sort of you're sort of allowed to look in from second base uh, and try to steal a sign, and the catcher knows that, and see the sec- person on second base will often try to signal that to the batter. That's everybody knows that that's what they do. It's sort of okay, and the pitcher and catcher will change signs when there's a runner on second base. But a batter who turns his head slightly to try to steal the sign out of his the corner of his eye will usually be thrown at by his head will be. Uh, thrown at by the pitcher mm-hmm. because that's, quote, against the law. Mm-hmm. That's against the laws of baseball. So I, I think it's a Even very – Even it's not written. It's not written down anywhere, and no one judges the pitcher who throws at the batter that because he broke the rules, even though there's no rule. Yep. So I think that distinction in laws and legislation, law, rules and written and unwritten rules, very powerful. However, let me give you the flip side. The flip side is in certain times in, in history, it was acceptable to be disrespectful to people of different color, different religion, different sex, yep. and that was the norm. And they're, those are bad norms that, you know, we're not, I'm not talking about disc- statistical discrimination of various kinds against folks or, or pe- treating people differently. I'm talking about disdain and, and, and co- public commenting about people. Yep. Uh, that's gross. Yep. I'm glad we don't do that anymore. I'm glad that norm died out. But when that norm was in force and you could say, say, for example, disrespectful things about your wife or about blacks or about Jews – um, I'm glad that that was a bad norm. No, so I, I wouldn't want a judge to enforce no, that norm. I mean, in this, so how do you deal it, with that? Well, uh, it, look, the first thing to say is is the the the, the law in this sense it can't be expected to work perfectly any more than say markets can be expected to work you know perfectly. Um, the question is, is it, it's a cost benefit one. Uh, how much do you want to empower? people to consciously override these things, recognizing that by consciously overriding these things, they, they, they might wind up doing worse. They and, might be racist, well, anti look, look, homophobes. My favorite example is, is you, you mentioned disdain for blacks. Right? In the uh, uh, late 19th century U.S. South, the market was not tolerating segregation. It was too costly. And so you saw a lot of racial integration. So how did racists get the segregation that they wanted? They needed legislation. That's why we had Jim Crow legislation. And it was the Civil Rights Act of the middle part of the 19th, the 20th century, particularly the 1964 Civil Rights Act, that undid that legislation. Uh, and I, I agree that that legislation should be should have been undone, but it shouldn't have come in to begin with. And if we had not relied on legislation to begin with, we would not have had the problem later. There is this interesting 
interplay. Of, I'm sure there's a feedback loop between legislation and law. I have no doubt that Jim Crow legislation by, in fact, forcing blacks to the back of the bus and streetcar, as it were, that itself helped reinforce negative stereotypes. Yeah. Uh, Fair uh, enough. Uh, yeah. Fair enough. But let's move on. It's but, 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 but how you did recognize there's a role for, for legislation to change those things. So let's uh, give me 60 seconds on volume two. I'm sorry, because we've got to leave some room for the fatal conceit. Here it is. Uh, the very concept of social justice is meaningless. There, it, it, people use it. Justice has meaning only as it relates to uh, conscious action between individuals. I can treat you justly or not. The, the outcome, the unintended, unplanned outcome of millions of different actions cannot appropriately be discussed as being just or unjust. They, j- they just are. It may be that the the rules that gave rise to those outcomes are just or unjust. Maybe the actions were followed justly or, or, or not, but the outcome itself, if it's unplanned, can't be described as being just. So there's a thing as social justice. It's Max good. Walensky, by the way, has a great new video on this. Is it, uh, we'll provide a link for that. Yeah. Uh, is it a good book? Worth reading? Oh, yeah. Yeah, very good. Well, let's move on to my favorite <laughs> book of Hayek, which is The Fatal Conceit. It's quite short. Yes. There's debate about whether he actually wrote it. He was old and it was written under the – B- Bill, The late Bill Bartley. Uh, which – I forget his title there. He's not editor. He's sort of – he's editorish in it. And I, I've had the privilege of seeing the three-by-five cards that Hayek took notes on for that book in the Hoover Institution archives. They're a jumble. And so a lot of people – and there was also a, a seminar where I think Vernon Smith was – was Vernon Smith there? And others – Saw the early drafts of that book, said it was well, awful. Bu- Buchanan. Buchanan. Was Buchanan. Yeah, yeah. And uh, said it was awful and a, a, a hodgepodge. But, and, but the book itself is pretty good. So some people say this could have been written by Hayek. Uh, it was written by Bartley, really, when Hayek was old. Let's not go into that. Yeah. Forget that. I don't care whether Hayek wrote it or not. I, I really like the book. So tell me what, what's the main idea of the book and uh, why it's important. Well, it, again, it's the same theme that appears in The Road to Serfdom, that uh, it is a – we are conceited if we think that we can consciously plan the overall order of our society uh, in a way that would improve it from what it would emerge by uh, through evolution based upon rules of private property and, and, and freedom of contract. And that conceit, it's not only conceit, not only we fail, it's, it's a fatal conceit. It will lead to serfdom. Uh, it's a Hayek's conservatism comes out a lot more in the fatal conceit than it does in the earlier works. Although I don't think he became more conservative. I just think he's emphasizing themes. I just think it's in, in the emphasis. Maybe that comes from Bartley. I don't know. Uh, when I read it, though, it, it strikes me as Hayek. It sounds yeah. like Hayek to me. And uh, besides the quote we mentioned earlier, it has this wonderful quote, which was also I recited a few times about the microcosm and the macrocosm that – that we are socialists when we come deal with our family and our friends. We have an egalitarian streak that came out of our – he he attributes it to our emergence from the hunting and gathering bands of small groups. That now that we have this extended order of society, we have an impulse to extend that – those attitudes toward that larger group. He says that will lead, to, I think, to tyranny. And similarly, he says if we try to take the role the prices play and – in the macrocosm and bring it into our family, we'll destroy our family. So I think that's – those two things are my favorite moments in the book. But the book's – every page is interesting. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, 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 it, it, it's, a, it's a learned work of uh, – it's got learned history, learned intellectual history. Um, but the, the – you know, we can close just by, by reminding readers again that, you know, these four books all share – the one theme that it, I think is appropriately summarized by the title of the, of the last one, the, the fatal conceit. We fancy that we have the power to design and, and uh, guide uh, overall social forces in ways that we just don't have. Uh, and we try to. We, we send lots of well-paid people to Washington, D.C. and to Brussels. Uh, but – uh, they're, they're, they're not going to achieve their ends. And if we insist, if we, if we insist that they can, they, that they try to achieve those ends and, uh, you know, uh, until they actually do, <laughs> the ends will never be achieved. And then we will reach serfdom. Uh, now let's talk about, uh, 
where a beginner should start. So when I, let me, I'll give mine first, then you, you can go. Uh, I always tell people to start with – actually, I used to say read The Fatal Conceit. It's his best book. The problem with that is that it's, it's a little dense, even mm-hmm. though it's short. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of people I've given that book to don't read it. I'm sorry to report. And they read books, mm-hmm. right? It's not just that they don't read uh, – don't read. So I tend to now encourage people to read the essays first. So the two I start with are The Use of Knowledge in Society, which is very accessible. As you say, you can read it 35 times, still get something out of it. But the first time is pretty good. Yep. Uh, and then I also encourage people to read The Pretense of Knowledge, his Nobel Prize uh, address, which we haven't talked about, which is a wonderful indictment of macroeconomics and a statement about the limits of reason, which is a theme that runs through Hike that we haven't uh, talked much about, but certainly the – the limits of experts and certainly mm-hmm. top-down uh, hierarchy. So my my encouragement is is start with those essays and individual economic order is a book of essays that's that has more than one good one. It has the one you mentioned, the two we've mentioned so far, individual, individualism, true and false, and the use of knowledge of society. Um, try the fatal conceit. I then encourage the uh, the first volume of law, legislation, and liberty, and and after that. Uh, Whatever you you can get through, but I, I I think it depends on on what the if 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 the person who's asking you is you know wants to learn more about Hayek's economics, uh, the use of knowledge in society uh, and the pretense of knowledge are are great places to start. If the person's more interested in political philosophy, I actually think individualism, true and false, is a great place to start. He's got another essay in uh, uh, the the. The Individualism and Economic Order, the 1948 collection called Free Enterprise and the Competitive Order, which is very short and very good. In these uh, studies collections, new studies in philosophy, politics, and economics and, and, and studies, he has some – his most accessible accessible essays actually. He has some essays on Adam Smith, on David Hume, on Bernard Mandeville, uh, on liberalism, uh, which in a way are, are, are his most accessible to a non-specialist e- e- economist. Um, but there's other, another essay that I'd like to mention that I I think is uh, it's I think it's in the New Studies collection. It's called the New Confusion about Planning. It's very accessible, uh, and in that Hayek makes very clear. He said, you know, I'm I'm not opposed to planning. We should all plan, right? We don't, we don't want to go through life without plans. There's a lot of where who does the planning? It's a theme that appears elsewhere in Hayek's work, but he makes it really clear in this essay, and uh, um, the. The, the fact that we you know, are getting you know, uh, better computers in the 1970s when he's writing this, uh, that, that, that does, and, and democracy is more widespread. That doesn't mean that somehow we're, we're better able to plan at the overall social society level. Uh, trying to plan at that level will inevitably make, it, make us unable to plan successfully at the individual level. And lastly, um, I, uh, a listener wrote me, in the last uh, week or so, asking me about uh, emergent order, he said we, that I talk a lot about on the program. Uh, you know, what is it? Where can I find out more about it? If, I think if you listen for a long time to the program, it kind of seeps in, and you'll, you'll get a feel for it just from listening. My book, The Price of Everything, I try to, in a way, take what I learned from Hayek about emergent order and apply it to everything I could think of. Did um, a great job. Thank you. But where in Hayek, if you want to understand if you want to get it from the horse's mouth, you could argue the horse's mouth is is Adam Smith or, or Adam Ferguson. But if you want to get it from Hayek, he doesn't have an article called "What a Merchant Order Means to Me" he has or "Why a, I'm Not a Top Down Guy." He has. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's it's sort of the theme that that suffuses all of his Correct. writing. Yeah. But he has an essay uh, entitled, uh, I think it's entitled "The Results of Human Action, but Not of Human Design." Yeah. Uh, it's and again, this is one of his more accessible essays. Uh, and that is either in the 1967 collection or the 1978 collection uh, of essays by Hayek. Why don't you close by talking about Hayek's influence uh, on you, of, of these the things we're talking about? Uh, our, when I was in and co- what you still read of his? What do you go back to and read? You mentioned the Usenology in Society. Uh, what else do you What else do you go back to? So talk about the – what do you go back to and how I go, I'll go back to – well, because of what's still happening today, I go back to Hayek's macro more and more. And I, I, I still find it to be really really profound and unfortunately uh, neglected uh, or, or misunderstood not only by Keynesians but by, by our friends at Chicago. 
Chicago as a as a school, school not as a place. Um, when I, I started studying economics in 1977, and, and one of the first people I was introduced to the work, Milton Friedman, and of course he turned me on, right? I was reading his Newsweek articles, and I remember going into my still beloved professor, Bill Field's office, uh, after having read something by Friedman, and saying, why, Milton Friedman, he must be the, he's, I'm sure he's the greatest living economist, and Bill, Fre- Bill Field said, no, he's the second greatest and I remember getting all tingly, saying, whoa, there's someone better than Friedman? I mean, this is just too good to believe. Now, who is it? And he said, Hayek. And I'd never heard of Hayek. And that's when he pulled um, the, in his copy of Individualism and Economic Order off the shelf and, and asked me to read The Use of Knowledge in Society. And, uh, uh, it's, and I, have, I go back to Hayek. I don't think there's a day in my life that goes by that I don't read something by Hayek. Maybe not a whole article every day, but something by Hayek. Um, I can't. I, I, his, his his worldview, his economics, his general philosophy, so pervades me. I I I've, I, I can't. It's difficult sometimes to to know what I got from him and what I didn't get from him. Um, he's. Uh, I never met him. I had a little bit of correspondence with him back in the in the in the late eighties. Um, I never met him, but from what I know and from, from just from reading his, his, his stuff, he seems like, like a very gentle man, certainly humility. Well, it's another way, if you want one word to summarize Hayek's worldview from the 1920s until he died in 1992, humility, right? <laughs> Don't be so arrogant to think that you can do more than you really can do. You can't, um, uh, the social processes know a lot more, no, no, in quotations more, a lot more than you can possibly know. Don't be so arrogant, you person who thinks that you can affect aggregate demand to make the economy better. Don't be so arrogant to think that you can design a series of regulations that will result in higher wages uh, for workers who until now were, were not getting higher wages without having some unintended consequences on innocent people. Uh, so be humble. Hayek uh, 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 cared deeply about keeping space for individuals as large as possible so that individuals can make and pursue their own plans. And he understood that the arrogance of trying to plan society would inevitably constrict that space and not, as progressives and other, many other people believe, enlarge it. My guest today has been Don Boudreau. Don, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Always my pleasure. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.